Hello, welcome to the uh, YouTube podcast, episode number 83, where we talk all things U2. And in this particular episode, we're going to be talking your U2 related questions. But uh, for this episode, I'm joined to help with all your questions because there is a lot of them. It was started as an idea that I, while well, I was sitting and watching a hockey game, that I should just quickly do an episode before I head off to Montreal and answer some silly questions, maybe. And then all of a sudden, a flood came in. So I recruited some help all the way from Amsterdam. Uh, Caroline, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Chris. Thank you. We've been uh, teasing or uh, wanting to have you on, teasing the idea of having you on, and haven't got to it yet. So this this will serve as the the warm up, I guess, to your future full length uh, interview, in depth discussion <laughs> with your yeah. YouTube yeah. history or something. And eventually I'll join the at U2 staff. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the pay is really good and uh, yeah, all the benefits, you know. <laughs> yeah. Our, uh, I'll just, uh, our connection actually, your, yours and my connection goes back to, you were the person who first, air quotes, hired me to work with uh, any sort of U2 fan site back on U2log.com, which I just noticed today, actually I was going to mention before, that it doesn't resolve anymore, the site. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> You don't want to know. <laughs> I was going to move the site to a cheaper spot, or back it up at least. Uh oh. And then I deleted the wrong database. I oh no. Deleted the live database. <laughs> I do have an export, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's okay. That's... But it, I mean, it'd been offline for, or it'd been non functional for, I don't know, half a decade, even yeah. more, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't remember when we quit. 2011. Yeah, I something think. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. But at any rate, there's still lots of uh, YouTube fan sites. That one just had its own unique flavor and style to it that was a lot of fun as well. Um, but uh, by way of introduction to the audience, I guess, who may not know who you are or, or your connection to YouTube or anything like that, we always ask folks when they come on the podcast, what was the thing, the the moment, the album, the whatever that got you into U2 in the first place? Subconsciously, 1983, I heard U2 when I went out clubbing here in uh, Holland. And it was um, New Year's Day. Uh, it was that song and uh, The Clash's um, Rock the Cashbar that really caught my attention. I didn't really know much about pop or rock music at that time. So I had no idea who the bands were or, you know, what the songs were. But I remember, remember those two songs. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, I think late 84, that's just one year later, I guess. Late 84, I saw um, a German live show. Uh, from the Unforgettable Fire Tour. Mm. And that was it. I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> I'd actually heard of the band through a couple of high school friends that um, had gotten into uh, Jesus. Uh, they joined, um, I think they joined Youth for Christ or something something like that. Um, we were invited as friends, high school friends, we were invited to their parties and the, they were sitting in a corner discussing war, I realize now. Right. Uh, discussing the lyrics and their, uh, um, the Christianity in, in the lyrics. And yeah. we were in the other side going, what? <laughs> 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 um, but I remember that and then I saw them on German TV and I was hooked. Uh, I missed their Dutch concert at the time because that was in o October, I think. Um, I became a an actual fan in, I think, January 1985. Right. And very quickly thereafter, I joined the Dutch fan club because I heard them on the radio and I thought, hmm, that'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah. And you've over the years, there's you've been involved with. Um, I know there's a book that got published, uh, like a fan club book you were you've been you've written for u2.com at least once that i know of for sure if not other times I oh many times yeah. many times now yeah yeah uh, there's two u2 books and the articles for u2.com yeah 
And uh, and when did what was the inspiration or desire, I guess, to start something like U2Log.com back in the day when when that sort of first kicked off? Well, that grew out of um, a bunch of friends that hung out on IRC. IRC, for those who don't know, is <laughs> sort of a precursor to Skype, I guess. It or Slack. A very very yeah. Yeah, Slack it was the Slack fancy. without the interface. Yeah. I mean, Slack is exactly that, yeah. IRC with an interface. Um, and this was around 95, 96. And we, met, we all met on Channel U2 on IRC, became friends, and a lot of us are still friends, best friends, even. Um, and... Um, it was around 96, 90, yeah, late 96, I think, that you 2 were sort of finishing off the pop album in the studio, and they had a webcam in the studio. And not a lot of people were actually online at the time. It was just, it seemed like just us. Uh, and uh, the bunch of us were watching this webcam in the studio, like, day and night. Yeah. And... Mm, the people in the studio, I think, not you two, but the people that were running that webcam, be became aware of us and they started doing sort of jokes. We'd comment on it and they would put up jokes in the studio and it was very funny. And we, we wanted to... Um, that funny... That funny thing, that humour that we had uh, was something that we... that I felt was missing from a lot of well, there weren't very many back then, but from U2 sites that were mainly North American at the time, because uh, the web had, hadn't really broken through in, in, in Europe yet. So um, we, uh, we wanted, I, I thought I wanted uh, a weblog, which nobody had heard of, <laughs> that would, you know, you'd be able to quickly react to news and we wanted to have sort of wanted to take the mickey and be irreverent about the band because a lot of the the, the bigger sites were so um, serious. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we wanted a, a secular, irreverent look at the band, uh, sort of a, a British, Irish, Australian vibe, and kind of humor that doesn't really exist on uh, in North America. And that's that's why we started YouTube log. Yeah, which it's it's a great, and I think even today, obviously taking nothing away from all the YouTube fan sites that are out there, there is a bit of still like, uh, and maybe it's my <laughs> my subs, um, what's the word, uh, my desire anyways or role or whatever with that YouTube is a bit of like uh, trying to like you said taking the piss or whatever. Because mm -hmm. they're a very serious band at times, and they they have a very serious message, and they have a very serious desire mm -hmm. to be artists and be creative, and and to have their art respected, and all of that, which is they do. But then they also obviously are humans who have a playful side, who yeah. like to laugh, you know, and and even within the organization, you can see that, and and this absolutely seems to be, you know, they're fairly protective. They have their sort of inner circle, obviously, and they don't. Mm -hmm often let their guard down outside of that um but i yeah it seems like it's okay to to laugh a bit every now oh, and then yeah. i mean lipton, lipton village was all about you know taking the piss and yeah yeah taking the mickey out of each other yeah to show them how much you love them right yeah it's what family yeah. does kind of almost yeah 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 and that's what you referenced earlier the sort of youtube family that grew up in, in around you or not around you but like that you grew mm -hmm. up with or whatever um and sort of that vibe of friendship and um like a love for the band but almost like the band could disappear for a while and the friendship obviously still remain even i know you had a bit of a uh falling out with the band in, in, of sorts in terms of fandom anyways like i had to it, i had to at the time how come you why do you think that because i uh um i was getting involved with gavin friday as a as a fan but also as somebody who I wanted to um, help him in his career and um, for a while I think I had to show that I wasn't in into it because of you too. That was mm. still a big thing. He was also very wary about making his connection with you two known. That's completely changed now, but 
At the time, I felt I had to do that. Uh, it was right at the time of uh, the pop tour, and I can still, I'm still mad at myself for missing out on a lot of that tour. I only, I only saw five shows. Uh, could have been so, so many more, so yeah. much more. <laughs> And so you stayed away for a while, a bit, like yeah. from the band and even subsequent tours and stuff, a bit like sort of, you were obviously aware that they were around and stuff, yeah. but um, kind of like disengaging a bit from, from the band. And and so what, you re-engaged Innocence and Experience kind of time frame or what was a bit sooner? Oh, well, earlier, I think, I think once, once my working relationship with Gavin was properly settled, um, mm-hmm. I had more time for other things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you had your your uh, come in the in the Christian circles. It would be like coming back to Jesus, but you had your coming back to Bono. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember which. It must have been a tour or something, but I can't remember which one. Yeah. There's also a period. Those albums after pop. Uh, <laughs> Not <yeah>. a fan. <laughs> Not a fan. So I got he- heavily, heavily back into them during uh, No Line on the Re- Horizon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because um, they, I, re- I remember distinctly remember you getting um, getting to write on YouTube dot com a review of seeing. I think it was the Innocence and Experience tour, almost like where it was presented as if you weren't a fan as much anymore, and now you were, or something like that. Where? Oh uh, yeah, you know, you have you know uh, uh, peaks and. I don't mm-hmm. know how to say it in English, but you know, yeah, you peaks and valleys. And your, peaks and valleys in your fandom. So I go. Yeah. Oh, I don't. You know, it's always in between tours. I get bored. Uh, yeah. <laughs> forget about how great they are, and uh, yeah. maybe don't like the album that much. And then you hear the songs live, and they come alive. Yeah. Uh, that mm, that very much happened with Innocence and Experience. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I think I'm. I'm guess I can only speak from having worked with two YouTube fan sites. I don't. I'm, <laughs> I don't know how many people yeah. get to work with multiple YouTube fan sites, but I think that's a common like. The gap between albums gets longer, and you're like, okay, what's we're we're at, what's the point? And maybe we should shut it all down and dream it back up again or whatever. But mm. um, yeah, so. Um, the uh, in in terms of uh, U2 news, or actually before we go go on, I was going to ask, are you seeing them on the Experience and Innocence tour at some point, or hoping to? I am. Um, it's funny. I was uh, I read a quote from that interview that Edge did with Rolling Stone mm-hmm. today or yesterday, whatever, uh, where he's saying that this tour is for the real fans, or you know that. <laughs> and I'm saying, yeah, but we didn't get any tickets. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, if you want to play for your real fans, give us tickets. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. We got tickets. We scraped, we scraped tickets together. Um, <laughs> we still haven't got everything we want. Uh, we got tickets to shows we didn't want. Oh, okay. Uh, I got we. I've got Amsterdam sorted, so that's two shows. I've got uh, Paris sorted, but I don't want to go to Paris <laughs> for maybe obvious reasons. It just doesn't. Ugh. It's a bit scary, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, we were, uh, we got tickets for Copenhagen. Okay, <laughs> we're going to Copenhagen, and we wanted to go to Berlin, and uh, I'm half sorted for that, and still need tickets for the other. But I have my sources. <laughs> well, that's what it sounds. All of those places sound more exotic and interesting than what we get over here. But I guess it's just familiarity, because it's like Duluth, Tulsa, whatever. <laughs> Uh, don't sound I, as exciting sure as Berlin. I'm sure Duluth but. is just as exciting as Copenhagen. <laughs> I'm sure it is. In in reality, yeah. it's it's a stadium, yeah. and you're inside, and yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you referenced the Rolling Stone article just in in terms of what uh, you would find if you listened and subscribed to the at U2 news brief, which you can listen to on your Google, Apple, uh, Amazon devices. Mm-hmm. You can ask for the at U2 news brief, and there's a. Uh, a couple articles dropped in Rolling Stone in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Andy Green had interviews with Adam Clayton and The Edge at some point over the last little while. And uh, just a couple mentions of uh, for the <laughs> the Asia-Australian fans. Adam, of course, teased it again but didn't say anything specific. 
There are parts of the world we just haven't been to for the past few years. We haven't been to Australia, Japan, Southeast Asia. We really haven't spent that long in Europe, so perhaps we'll lengthen the tour. But in reality, maybe we need to find a way of being in bigger places again. So, not really anything new to say for the Australian etc. fans who aren't getting this tour as of yet. South American fans, um, there's lots of parts of the world we haven't been to <laughs> with a tour lately. So, um, And any thoughts on plight of fans in far off places that don't get the band? It's it. impossible for them to go everywhere, but it'd be nice if they did. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And if they play in Japan, I'll go. <laughs> yeah, you'd go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> and it was funny, actually, Adam's, uh, he referenced Lord of the Rings as far as just Andy had asked him as part of the sort of Heart of Darkness or whatever episode part of the concert. And he referenced the Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth kind of gathering around and stuff. And it was just kind of funny to think of. Adam sitting in his kimono watching Lord of the Rings series, probably the extended <laughs> edition, I would imagine. But, um, and then the Edges interview as well. Um, they both actually talked to Andy, asked them bo- both about not playing Joshua Tree, and he re- mentioned something about how, like you said, uh, we knew that play- we were probably coming. We knew that we were that people probably came to the Joshua Tree show, but have not come to this knowing it was going to be more weighted towards new albums, and that's fine. This is for the fans of our more recent work, the more committed fans. <laughs> who really listen to everything and go to everything. We feel okay about that. And Adam had said, I think we're all excited about the idea of not having to delve back into the Joshua Tree. So your thoughts on No Joshua Tree as we've... Obviously, we're talking spoilers for the concert, yeah. so sorry if it's if that's nice um, to you. <laughs> it's fi- f- fine with me. Uh, I, uh, I don't mind spoilers, but I've tried not to watch too much or you know, not even look at pictures that much. Right. Uh, but I have listened to the live Mixler uh, audio broadcast. Um, do you know, you know, get up in the morning and then there'd be a show from God knows where in America. <laughs> and I'd, you know, put it on and go to work and have the show, you know, on my commute to work. It's ridiculous, really, but yeah, that's uh, modern uh, technology. Great. Um, I love the show. I love how it sounds. I don't even need the pictures. I love that there's no streets or pride. Or pride's there, but, you know, the streets and pride are the songs that we used to hate on. Oh, not again, you know, as as spoiled fans going to multiple shows. But somewhere around, not the Joshua T2, but the one before that, I lost all mm, jadedness about set lists. I don't care what they play anymore. I just want to be there with my friends and experience it, whatever they have to give us. And uh, if that makes me uncritical, then so be it. I'm 55 years old. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to have fun. Yeah. Enjoy them while it lasts. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, the thing is, sometimes you want to hear that one particular song and then they play it and it's meh, you know. Mm-hmm. And then there's other times, but for example, um, I hated uh, the Innocence uh, and Experience album. Um, the songs like uh, Cedarwood Road wouldn't come alive from from the album. And then when I saw Cedarwood Road on um, live, I thought it was the best thing since you know sliced bread or whatever. It was <laughs> yeah yeah it blew me away. So you never know which song it's going to be that's going to make that concert special for you. So basically, I don't care what they play. There's, al- there's always going to be that song. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what often I know we kind of dance around sometimes on the podcast, even of mentioning like they are, there's only so many tours left, like whether it's hmm. three or one or none <laughs> or whatever, there's some finite amount of tours coming. And, and so, yeah, like I think... That's where I'm, I'm. I know Matt's said this a lot too. Of just be being thankful that obviously we can criticize and we can talk and have fun with it, but like Absolutely. being thankful yeah. for yeah, just getting to enjoy the music still and having a band that actually stayed together this long, uh, even in itself with original members and etc. Mm. is I think a yeah a privilege we sometimes take for granted. So, um, but I know there's I've lots of. To, I've had to mute some of the <laughs> fights on Twitter. I just couldn't cope with it anymore. I, yeah. Come on. 
I have most fans on Twitter, most YouTube fans on Twitter, if I, if I know they're a YouTube fan anyways, I, I have a YouTube fan list that I'll dive into, but I don't follow a lot of them directly, which hopefully they don't take personally, but it's just mm-hmm. kind of like my way of having those two worlds. When I need to get my YouTube fan fix, I can dive in mm. and then keep it sort I keep of, forgetting about lists. Yeah, I assumed they were going to take them away, for, yeah. and so I didn't use them for a long time, and then I recently yeah. sort of dove back into them, but um, mm. yeah, it's... I'm not a news hound, so don't don't follow me for <laughs> whatever Bono might have had for breakfast. But I'll <laughs> I'll tweet out when uh, when we're going live with the podcast is basically, and then otherwise I'm just complaining about the weather. So, um, yeah, there's there's a bunch of interesting stuff. If you're they they like revealing in a, a fun way, I guess about the current tour. If you go read those articles, they'll be in the show notes, which you can find it either in your podcast player if you're watching or listening, I guess, but you can tap through and, and find the links or goodstuff.fm slash ATU2 slash 83 will be the link or the episode for this, uh, links for this episode. Um, yeah, so I've got uh, Montreal coming up for my first experience of experience in innocence in a few days. But before that, I just wanted to get an episode out to the podcast listeners so that we won't, I won't be recording one uh, Wednesday night next week like we normally would because uh, I'll be dancing, sitting, not sitting, dancing or singing along, I guess, to the concert. Are you, that's what I was going to ask you, are you a sit back and just sort of soak it all in or are you jumping up and down at the front or somewhere in between What when you go to a U2 show? Generally, I am an observer. So uh, I, in the past, I would maybe jot down notes. Now I would tweet stuff right um on the last on the joshua 3 tour i was a streamer streamer i mixered oh yeah stuff yeah i enjoyed that and i'd sing along i'd never done that before <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah so people can hear and that's yeah, yeah it's a funny kind of like hearkening back to the old like mixtapes and recording of concerts that you know bootlegs and stuff of old we had a. Uh, uh, one of our staffers is a younger guy, Mason, who's been on the podcast, and he had posted a picture to the U2 Slack group of at uh, U2 Slack group of uh, a bootleg, and he was like, "What is this?" <laughs> from <laughs> sorry, I think it was Zuti Vieira maybe or something, but it was just because yeah. there's a lot of bootlegs from that one in particular that I remember. But you know, I like because it's like, well, if it's out there, it must be you know official material or whatever, and it's kind of mm. just like, no, that's a bootleg that we paid way too much for that now you guys just get you know, a million copies of because it's just everywhere. <laughs> Mixler, it's I, I used to be uh, a big, uh, ta- not a tape, I didn't tape myself. I did have the gear, but I didn't tape the two gigs. But I was, uh, I would swap yeah. tapes all over. I had a, like, a thousand to 1200 cassette tapes. All you two gigs. Yeah. Uh, and I had to listen to them all to, for the book we did. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. So those are all, kept safely the in an pre- archive precursor, precursors to the, the the databases that we now have yeah online yeah <laughs> so do you have no I, I sold them i sold yeah. them oh yeah yeah probably yeah. to aaron govern of uh no, <laughs> no to a dutch to a dutch fan yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh but yeah so it's uh yeah it's crazy the world we are, we are in right now, and I know that's something the band obviously is grappling with, technology and how to incorporate it best into the shows and how not to, and, and just play the music and all that kind of stuff. So, Which leads us into, in a kind of awkward way, into the mailbox, because we got, <laughs> there's, I don't know if you saw the list, there's a bunch of questions, no, and we'll, yeah. we'll sort of uh, have a little fun with them. Um, okay. But uh, we'll start with uh, someone, I'm not even familiar with who this is, at YouTube.com, Sherry asked, uh, who is McFisto's dentist? So, you haven't seen, have you seen visuals? Or do you, yeah, did you even want it. to know that? I guess you know what's going on. Yeah. You hear that. Yeah, I, yeah. Know, I know what's going on. Yeah. So. Uh, I could give a boring answer to that. <laughs> like, like all of you two and all their friends and all their lovers and whatever, they all use the same doctor. So I suppose they all have the same dentist. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Maybe you should what, bleep that. Maybe that's inside. I <laughs> well, I, I would assume they would have that too. It's not, yeah. yeah. The, given the the Godfather like uh, circle that they keep, mm. Mm. Um, but maybe you know this. This is probably really deep inside information. Why isn't Adam's kimono thanked in the EI tour tour book? And and Adam's kimono, the Twitter account at Adam's kimono, chimed in saying, "Why am I not listed in the credits? Why are there no glossy photos of me in the tour book? Why am I not featured on the huge screen at the shows? Why are kimonos and robes not included in the merch?" <laughs> so. 
Maybe you're not sleeping with the right person. <laughs> yeah, Adam is probably not the right person. You need to get to Larry is, I think, yeah. where you need to be. Yeah, that makes sense. Just sleeping with the right person. <laughs> um, at JT asked, do you think the Fly character may return one day? What do you think? I could say, while you're, while you're I humming. I hope so. Yeah, that's yeah. My, my answer to it would be, I hope so, and I... I uh, I could see in the the playful way that they've sort of brought back the McFeesto character and sort of tease other characters here and there. I think maybe I don't know if he might had the showman kind of character on the Joshua Tree tour, and maybe maybe he's done creating new characters and he'll just kind of re-inhabit them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all the same character anyway. Uh, Carol, can you just uh just try refreshing your browser? I'm getting some buzzing. From your okay. audio, it sometimes seems like Chrome. Apologies, folks who are watching or listening live. Is that better? No, I'm still doing it, but mm. might have to just live with it. Okay. Um, let's see where. Are we? Oh yeah, and uh, this was kind of interesting one. Um, at JT also asked, so I, I sent out the tweet asking for questions. I'm just going to read them more or less in the in the order, unless someone sent in a lot, and then they may mm. get chopped off at the end. At JT asked, as they enter their 60s in a few years. Uh, will we see the same presence of the band or instead do you foresee a more conservative approach in, al- in terms of albums slash touring? Which... Age doesn't seem to stop the Rolling Stones. I mean, they, I know, seem, like... they seem to be continuously touring. So, um, Yeah, I just follow. I saw they're, they just played in Dublin at Croke Park. And it's mm. like, if they're still going, I, it feels like, you know, there's a, uh, that's kind of like how I view life too, is like, for me, my parents are around. And so like, they're still the the barometer of what old is and my grandparents have passed, but that was like yeah. really old. So <laughs> I guess in the same way, if the stones are around and touring, you two could keep going. I think, don't you think there's a desire to like scale back? They they love the fan thing, but they also hate the touring life maybe a bit, or do they, do you think it's, they're good to keep going? I don't, know, I don't think they know any better. Like <laughs> this is what they do. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't, if they hate it, if they hated the tour life, they wouldn't do Three tours, like back to back, uh, back to back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at uh, Beth and Bono asks, which disappointing shirt are you going to spend forty dollars on <laughs> in terms of U two tour merch? <laughs> Have you seen any I, of the? I've seen some. I rarely, rarely buy tour merchandising. Yeah, I had tweeted at her because she's been to 11 or so shows already and would have a better idea of the merchandise or, <laughs> than I would. I'm a, I'm, I'm either too cheap or too worried that I'm going to buy the wrong size at the show. And then, like I have actually from the 360 tour, I think I have a, or no, yeah, How to Dismantle Atomic Bomb, I have a shirt that I bought that's too small. And so now it just sits in my <laughs> plot drawer. It's a nice memory, I guess, but unless I lose a whole bunch of weight, mm. it's not going to yeah. fit. So <laughs> I'll wait for I my have, kids. Uh, I bought the Cedarwood Road. Uh, t-shirt. Oh yeah. Uh, and then I found out that Gavin designed it. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I don't wear it. I just don't wear band shirts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Beth Bono also asked, "What do you think is the disaster that strikes in the middle of the How to Hold Me, Throw Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me intermission video, which Gavin has a role in?" That's I didn't even think of that until I just. Yeah, asked I didn't. I I guess I haven't looked too closely. I've just listened to it, not yeah. really looked at the visuals, so I don't recall seeing a, a disaster yeah that's what i'm i'll have to see it too I, i'm someone else at new wave dame asked i'm curious too in all in los angeles bono hinted at it being pop thoughts <laughs> so <laughs> <which would be. laughs> uh, they need to get over that yeah <laughs> i love pop maybe it's just larry that needs to get over it too uh okay mm-hmm. at t darby 719 asked when do we see bono play the three chords he knows <laughs> I think with the bike accident he had and stuff, I don't know if he's hey. playing guitar again. Maybe he can play one. One <laughs> chord or, or the song one. <laughs> yeah. If they, actually, if Edge tuned a special guitar for him, you could, and it was a like song in D, <laughs> then he could just strum the whole thing and it wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. And just do bar chords maybe or whatever. So, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that we'll see him um, officially play guitar again, but uh, on tours, we'll see. At JT asked, do you see the 2019 as the year of we have to go away and dream it all up again for the band? Uh, JT's very focused on the band getting old and <laughs> stopping. Um, it feels like they... The I, I think they're, they're on a... They have sort of second wind. Yeah. I think they're in a very creative... Um, 
uh, era. Phase era, yeah. Phase, yeah, yeah. Mm, they shouldn't stop. Yeah, I, I know. Go even, fur- go even further. Go out there. Yeah. Mm. Like I feel, it feels like they could do the equivalent, like sort of Zuti or um, Actung Baby, and then Zuropa, and then the what was like Pops. Whether debatable whether Pop was the like the third part of that trilogy, let's say, but whatever it maybe could have been or should have been or whatever. But uh, if Songs of Innocence and then Experience, and then whether they do Songs of Ascent or just something completely different, I feel like yeah, there's a uh, something in the water right now yeah. for them. Do you remember the Glastonbury gig a couple of years back? Yes. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I, when I watched that show, I thought it's over. That's <laughs> that's it's the end. End of the line. Like this is not working. Just something at and, the show, uh, not that they were doing Glastonbury itself, but just something about just the, the, the lack of connection with the crowd. Mm. Like playing for a crowd that hated you too, you know. Right. Yeah, that generation. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, I mean they seem to have found a connection again. Yeah, you could see someone like a, especially, I picture a Larry and an Edge, not knowing them at all, obviously, but just oh. judging from exterior. But I could see them being very aware, hyper, like Bono would be a ver- very aware of the audience as well, I'm sure. But he, it, mm. to him, it feels like it's, for him, it'd be a challenge to like win them over again. Whereas mm. Edge and Larry, it feels like, like they'd be more in the, well, piss off, let's just take our stuff and go home <laughs> if they're not going <laughs> to... Yeah. like us or whatever and it wouldn't be worth the effort of a whole tour to try and win people back but yeah they mm-hmm. seem to have done yeah. something um at beth mono asked if you've been following set lists which unplayed songs of innocence song do you most wish they'd play on a, on a future show and um, um i'm no i'm no longer a set list person and <laughs> have trouble keeping up which song is on which album like, yeah i'm old <laughs> They've uh, yeah. they referenced in the Rolling Stone article that they have they have played a lot of the new songs on this tour. Um, Little things is the common theme that comes up, and that would be one that I would. I heard it in Joshua Tree at the Joshua Tree show because they played it at the end of Vancouver's, mm-hmm. and it, it was a bit of a dud there. But um, yeah, like so I said, it would fit better in this tour. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. And then Showman, I'd like to see them just have fun with. Like it feels like a fun sh- mm. song, but I don't. I can see how it wouldn't fit thematically necessarily in this tour, mm. but. I've only recently started actually listening to the album now that I've heard it live, mm. uh, and uh, so and enjoying it. and enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, because you have uh, a, a frame of reference for the live yeah, versions yeah. now. Back to the sort of studio. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Um, okay, let's see. Next question that makes some sense to go at New Wave Dame. Why do you think the Edge is still wearing that jacket with fringe on tour? <laughs> Uh, I didn't know he. I didn't know he was wearing. Maybe it's comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. Or he's getting. Or he's getting sponsored for it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there is a Edge's flannel Twitter account as well that chimed in there somewhere too. Really? So of course, yeah. Uh, all of their clothing seems to pick up a Twitter didn't account. This, didn't this all start with Adam's hair? <laughs> That's still a secret. I wonder. I, I wonder who started that. I don't remember. <laughs> I can't remember either. Uh, uh, at Atomic Bomb asked, when are they coming to Australia? Which uh, I wish we could tell you, Atomic Bomb. Yeah. Uh, again, I might go if it's Australia. Oh, Australia too, you'd go? Yeah, because uh, one of the original U2 log uh, crew uh, has moved back to Australia. And he's you know, one of my best friends and I want to see him again. So. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we never did have a, a full uh, U2 log meetup. That's really no, <laughs> a little too scattered. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one benefit, I guess, to being North American focused or centric. With for yeah. not that, but yeah. I'm even in that. I'm, I'm not including mm. those, some folks. Yeah, we were school. Australia, America, Amsterdam, London, and Dublin. And Canada, I'm, I'm not American. Remember. And Canada, yeah, yeah. Oh, and France as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's very international. Uh, at WTSHNN, which I think stands for Where the Streets Have No Name. Is it getting better or do you feel the same? Is that all? Does love light up your Christmas tree? Who's going to ride your wild horses? Uh, so in order for me, uh, yes, no, <laughs> no, uh, yes, and I don't know who's going to ride my wild horses. <laughs> Can you remember the order of... <laughs> my my horses, uh, they shoot horses, don't they? <laughs> 
Uh, at Grown Men's asked, so when you use the YouTube app before Love is All We Have Left, it appears to look and sound like a waterfall falling onto the crowd in GA. What do we think the significance of that is? Are we being baptized or reborn by water? Or is U2 saying that everybody stinks and needs a bath from queuing all day? So there's... We were talking about this earlier. Yeah. The, uh, I'll let you... I'll just say the official answer, at least as far as tour folks, was answered by Rick Lipson. There's a CNN story video that'll be in the show notes if you want to watch a bit of that, if you haven't seen that already. But your thoughts, Carolyn? Yeah, I was thinking if the... the theme or the, the underlying uh, whatever uh, uh, um, focus of the show is, was uh, Bono's uh, mysterious event uh, that he went through uh, uh, since it's, you know, they start off with uh, the sound of an MRI. I thought this might be uh, uh, the event, mm -hmm. maybe a hole in an aorta or something like uh, an aneurysm. Um, that was that, that was I was that was what I was thinking of because my dad had one uh, last year. So and you referenced a lot of circles or um, yeah, like hole it's a lot looking. of circles and holes. Yeah, 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 which is very possible. And that's what uh, yeah they sort of said referencing mortality anyways in some form. So maybe depending on how deep you want to go into that and how specific they are being in the show anyways. But um, mm -hmm. at Mona Lizard asked, what are these? Upteen mix remixes of Love is Bigger for and who listens to them? <laughs> so <laughs> there's this thing called clubbing and people uh, apparently uh, still do that. Yeah, that's I mean uh, circling all the way back. That's what got you into you too, right? Well, not the club mixes, but yeah, because well we didn't have me well twelve inches. We had twelve inches, um, which is what this has you know evolved from, I guess. Um, I don't know. It's just to get it out there, you know, Yeah. to get it played, I think. It's so people, re just like me, recognize it from, you know, remember it from having heard it on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. What's that? Oh, that's you too. Oh, I must check that out, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's just, yeah, they're, whether you love them or hate them, they're probably, if you don't like them, they're probably not for you. And but <laughs> if you love them, then they are for you. It's a simple yeah. way of looking at it, I guess. But um, I, I can remember other, yeah, like, definitely act time baby they had a lot of remixes for and sort of tried to get that out into other music cultures beyond their typical rock um yeah they're always looking for new fans mm -hmm. yeah i think actually this is the first tour they ever said that the existing fans are important yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> Uh, a question that was emailed in is kind of more of a rant, but uh, why is merchandise and visual branding so ugly? <laughs> I prefer a cleaner, more classic look, but their merchandise for I&E and E and e and i tours look so bad. Don't get me started on the merch for I&E of &E them laying in bed together. Who is the target audience? I hope there's not another U.S. leg of this tour. They need to go to Asia, Australia, etc. then call it a day. Take some time, go back to recording, and make it a risk-taking album. That seems to be a common, like, disregard in the merchandise thing, because we don't really know you and I is. We haven't been there but yet, but... The, like this Using desire the to like the beholder. yeah exactly that part but also the the theme of a lot of fans is like they wish the band would take more risks and uh and i feel like it's a it's a fair like feeling to have i guess but i feel like when you actually think about just the structure of it's not just four guys and the organization that they represent and the people and there is a, a certain amount of like they are taking risks each time they put it on an album that it's not going to go over and that'll be the last one and all these people who've staked their lives and careers with them besides their mm -hmm. own immediate family that sort of inner circle we've talked about they ride along with them for better or worse and so yeah. there is an element of you know it's not just um, trying a new whatever guitar sound for Edge or whatever and that's like all he's risking mm -hmm. like they are sort of risking their careers each time they put out something new I think um, even though it feels like well they're U2 and they can get away with anything i think yeah you know, <laughs> they, they've shown that they can't in certain ways like <laughs> in terms of sales anyways and, and that kind of stuff so do you have any thoughts there uh if, if you're as big as you do it must be both scary and risky and difficult to uh to be edgy all the time mm -hmm. mm, and to take that risk it, as you say like there's so many riding on it so many people's lives riding on it, livelihoods riding on it. I mean, yeah. um, I don't know. Yeah, 
I, you know, my entire history uh, as a fan, I've wanted them to be more risky and to do, you know, my favorite albums are Zuropa and, you know, Passenger. Yeah, you know, I love that kind of stuff, but they're a mainstream band and they have a mainstream following and they want to keep that mainstream following, following so they get the money to keep on putting on these spectacular shows. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if all they ever did was Passengers Europa, then maybe they wouldn't be as big. <laughs> but then they <laughs> wouldn't have the opportunity to do the big spectacle show that we love or enjoy, yeah. hopefully, in some form. And if you don't, then don't go to the show. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting line to walk. Um, and that's where I think, like I was saying before, the, the third album of this trilogy could almost be like something a little more experimental or a little more risk taking if you were but mm -hmm. but then they do risk and what's more risky than putting your own live up on your own life up yeah. on stage like that for everybody to see and yeah it's i mean it must be terrifying for them every night it's kind of like they yeah. I, was, I was explaining this to someone just a bit about the tour and i could feel that the other person who's not a youtube fan i could feel like them sort of glazing over a bit with like oh that's just bono he always does that what you know like putting him his heart on his sleeve and and life on display as if i think like he does for sure that's it's a true statement that he does that but it, it's also like um it's a, it doesn't make it easier yeah that's exactly it doesn't, <laughs> yeah just yeah. just because you do it all the time doesn't make it any mm -hmm. easier to do it. it in fact as if you do a sports analogy or comparison like for the, the athlete who goes out there and puts himself out into the whether it's hockey or football or soccer or whatever it gets harder as you get older physically. And I think that's an element of it for Bono, for sure, is, as we've seen mm -hmm. with his physicalness of, of his performance. But, um, and that's why things like the characters that he inhabits are created to allow him to sort of speak in a certain way that he otherwise feels uncomfortable with and, and, and doing night mm -hmm. after night on stage. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of risk going on that maybe we just take for granted maybe with the band. So, um, Speaking of risks, that's a, not really a relevant segue, but mm -hmm. <laughs> Eddie, I'll just leave it at Eddie because <laughs> mm -hmm. I mispronounce his name every time he sends a question in. Is there any mm -hmm. way to get across to the band that the current relevance of Mothers of the Disappeared in the news and to the tour theme outweighs the meaningless challenge of not playing anything from Joshua Tree? <laughs> I would write it on a little piece of paper, and when you're in the GA, just hold it up yeah. to the stage. That's how we used to do it back in the day. That probably is like the most meaningful or, or that or get Andy Green from Rolling Stone to ask them a question about it but yeah that would be the second most <laughs> powerful way probably but yeah. yeah I just saw you know how YouTube and whatever or Instagram I think it was randomly showed me a, like some video of a YouTube fan that somebody posted on their Instagram account from years ago when they held up a sign that said drummer or guitar player knows how to play song X and that's how they got on stage like it's really that mm -hmm. <laughs> simple yeah um, and then you can shout at yeah. the mic saying, Mothers of the Disappeared, and then start It pays to advertise, as Bono said, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at Bernard Caffey asks, uh, this will be relevant to you when, as the tour heads overseas, uh, from me, but home to you. I really hope they play American Soul when I see them in Berlin because I want to hear it live, but can't imagine they will play the American section of the show in Europe. What do you think? If they don't, what could they play? So you haven't seen they the can. show, but you've, yeah. They, they can play it. I mean... We're not unaware of what's going on on the other side of the pond. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just as relevant here, and they might as well use a Dutch. Well, if they play Amsterdam, they might as well put up a Dutch flag there because we've got the same problems going on over here, exactly the same. Yeah. So. Yeah, actually, a good test of that for folks will be actually the Montreal show coming up next week. Is what they do because, as much as sometimes the rest of the world lumps us together, Canadians definitely don't enjoy being especially the negative side of american news don't enjoy mm -hmm. being lumped in with america and and there's we 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 don't look our, down our nose at americans or by any means we consume a lot of their media we are Absolutely. involved in the news cycle etc and politics are very close because we're geographically very close but we're not like raw raw america is great and we certainly don't um resonate i guess with like the need to resuscitate america the way <laughs> you two seems to want to try to do breathe life back into it in the same sense or the same passion for that anyways um so i could see them going one of two ways where they just it's just two shows so they just play the same set list and mm. move on 
or they do try and tailor it a bit. Bono's had. Oh, the, I mean, he has his, you know, uh, advisors. Uh, I'm sure they call ahead. So what's going on in this country? Yeah. Who's the the big bully here? Uh, yeah. And uh, there's, I mean, there's lots of, you know, right wing idiots all over Europe that they can. Uh, <laughs> They can pick on. Make fun of. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I was going to ask, whether whoever that happens to be. But, like, we, I've seen photos, and, and, again, you don't have to reveal anything you're not supposed to or whatever, but, like, uh, whether it's Gavin Friday directly or other people, but, like, you know, he's write, writing down notes as he's watching the show, and then however much of their inner circle is also giving them feedback and stuff. And we joked, I think, in the last episode about, like, the video interns, like, nervously approaching Larry with, like, a new graphic for you know, American soul or whatever, and him like, you know, throwing his tea at them or whatever. But do you have a sense of like how, how big, how wide a swath of feedback do they actually take for a concert or a, a performance where they actually give it a, obviously anybody's free to throw criticism at them, but um, like that inner circle, is it the four of them plus Willie and, you know, S Devlin has been quoted a lot about production of the show and not much beyond that or, it goes beyond that. They can't do it on their own. So and then, so they have their inner circle, but the people in their inner circle can't do it on their own. They discuss things with people around them. So the, the circle spreads wider, I think, than you think. Right. Um, but um, I can only speak from my own little experience, not, I don't know how the rest, uh, I mean, the example of like the, the intern, you know, coming up with their own little graphic. <laughs> That might happen. I have no idea. I, yeah. 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 You sort of assume. You, I know on this tour, there's like a whatever the local city is is inserted into the "Hold Me, Thrill Me" graphics at at some point. Generally, uh, and except mm. for, I think it was different in Vegas where they. But they'll, you know, yeah. Well, I assume. I mean, I don't want to uh, get a big head or anything, but I assume all four of them religiously listen to this podcast, so I know that mm, yeah, we have absolutely. an effect on, the, <laughs> on what's happening. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. No, they don't. And we, <laughs> we, we, we routinely get emails, as I'm, I'm sure we did back in the YouTube log days, from people who feel like they're, or assume that they're actually emailing Bono directly when they contact us through the IU2 site. <laughs> Just to be f- clear, we don't have yeah. a direct line to yeah. anybody there. We can't get your tickets. We can't, uh, yeah. Anyways. All I don't stuff. even have a, you know, I'm not even that visible anymore. And I get, I still get mail. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody still knows <laughs> rumors. Obviously not for me. Or, yeah. You know. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's that's the list of questions we'll run through anyways for this episode. You can always send in questions, comments for the podcast by using hashtag ask at you too on Twitter. You can tweet at me. I'm I, Chris, if you want to. There's also a contact form on at you com, like I mentioned. I think it's under the about and then staff contact or something listing where you can send in a comment if you want to anonymously or, or not. And uh, that's how you can get your comments and questions onto the future episodes of the podcast. Caroline, if folks are wanting to uh, tweet at you or keep up with what you're doing these days, what's what's the digital world yeah, like Don't at me. <laughs> <laughs> She'll just block you, so no. <laughs> it's at C-V-O-D-B. C-V-O-D-B. Right. And any digital homes these days? That you, do, you, do you still do a website? Do you do those things anymore? Who has Gavin websites? GavinFriday.com. There you go. <laughs> Official website. Uh, YouTube log. You too long just still exists on Twitter. Very, very occasionally I might uh, <laughs> post something. I'll stri- I'll I'll mixler from it. I'll try a mixler Berlin and uh, nice. Copenhagen and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. Now that uh, we have uh, roaming in Europe. Oh yeah. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and also for folks who are listening, if you listen to this, I guess, before next week, next Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, the Montreal stop is happening. That's the next tour stop as we record anyways. And uh, there's uh, an Acrobat tribute band and December, the band from Scotland that we've had on the podcast, are putting on a pre-concert party at the Piranha Bar. The link to that um, where you can buy tickets is $10 in advance or $15 at the door. Uh, you can buy tickets to come to that. And I'll, I'm planning to be there. Uh, along with a whole bunch of other folks, I'm sure it's going to be a fun, fun time getting excited and uh, in anticipation of the U2 concert the next night. And then also, uh, I just want to mention U2Songs.com is doing an event after the first show where the lead singer of another U2 cover band called Elevation, Sean Brady, is doing a solo show, taking requests, performing other 
band so- stuff as well as U2. And it's, that one's going to be at Hurley's after the show, an Irish pub that's open until about 3. So, again, links for all that stuff if you're trying to keep up with what's going on at uh, goodstuff.fm slash atu2 slash 83. And, of course, you can also follow at U2, twitter.com slash atu2, uh, facebook.com slash atu2.com, instagram.com is the same, and, of course, just visiting at u2.com, atu2.com. All right. Thanks, Caroline. This is fun. Thank you. And yeah. uh, we will, uh, can't wait to hear your singing along with the Experience and <laughs> in Innocence Tour when it rolls through town or nearby. And yeah. uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks for watching. If you were watching as we recorded live, we record live generally Wednesday nights, uh, North American time anyways, uh, and uh, broadcast on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash goodstuff underscore FM, I believe. And you can be notified if you follow us along there. All right. Have a good day. See you later. Thank you.